Okay, here we go. This I've been looking forward to maybe all year. Dick, <laughs> Dick Hirsch in Barcelona. Hell yeah. And uh, I've taken a couple of pictures. We have a lovely view. We are not by the pool. Sorry to disappoint listeners. We wimped out. <laughs> Cooler heads prevailed. Yes, we want to have a little bit more um, a little more quiet because the pool is a little bit windy. And so now we're upstairs looking out over the ocean with big cruise ships. Getting ready. Yeah, and trying to make sense of a whirlwind two days of SAP Tech at Barcelona. Yeah, it was, as always, interesting. A lot of in- interesting impressions. So I think we have a bunch of different notes, but did anything stand out for you? Well, I mean, what I mean, as the the last um, as the the last few events have focused on Leonardo, um, it's interesting to take a look at in terms of where they are in terms of their the messaging, um, and it's curious to see that there is. If you take a take a look at Leonardo, usually the 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 messaging is it focuses on the technology in, in my opinion you have the cool stuff right. you have blockchain you have iot um your machine learnings in there right and so all sort of the your the voice buzzwords. assistant co-pilot right digital assistant it's all right and connected. i mean i think what's what's interesting is that the more we talk to people the the more we we, we try and get the idea across is that the technology itself shouldn't be leading this right um it should be because there are many companies which have the technology, the underlying technology. What SAP brings to the game, and this is what's important, is they have sort of the process. They have the process information, how the things fit into the business process, and that's right. their advantage. Right, and and I think that's the part of the message that is not getting out there enough from SAP's right. side. And so when when you hear the keynote today, and you know, for for my situation, I go to a lot of different shows and. So I'm always conscious of how is a vendor, when they talk, every vendor is going to talk about digital transformation. In SAP's case, they went back to the old intelligent enterprise saw, which I think is a dangerous one in some ways. But but that was part of the Star Trek sort of theme. So that's kind of, I think, why they brought that back. But you think about like, well, what makes you so different? You know, like right, exactly. every vendor is going to talk about what they can do there. And especially when you start getting into data and analytics like there's right. all kinds of players from so many different angles in that right. space and 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 let's face it a lot of them a lot of the vendors that have come up in that space have gotten very good at starting small in organizations and, right. and building out which right. has never been sap strength so i think that's led us down the road to some pretty interesting conversations this week around what leonardo really is and how they should be presenting it to the outside world so right because i mean if you take a look at things such as s4 and the digital core okay that in in my opinion um it's something that we shouldn't forget because that's really that's where many of these processes live um right and i think that sort of would have to sort of say okay leonardo fits into a process and this is where if you go to logistics it fits at this particular point in the the process and the, the process lives in the the back end, and I mean, it might not be yeah. sexy, but that's what what people really need to hear, right? And in the keynote, I don't believe there was a mention of ERP. <laughs> well, there was uh, one. There was, I think there was one talk, slide with it for a second. They talked about business applications a little bit and S four right. Hana from from that standpoint. Um, but I I really agree with that, and and it gets even deeper because it gets into like when you talk about Leonardo and you talk about. Oh, we do design thinking, which SAP, I think, has to be really careful about the idea that they have invented this way right. of sitting down and solving problems. Because right. in, in my view, when you gather experts in a room, you, you don't need a sophisticated methodology all the time. I mean, it's important to understand certain things about personas and right. people people that aren't in the room that you need to do re- user research on and stuff. Right. But the the danger there being like, without industry expertise and industry processes in those in those verticals, right. a lot of these customers are going to kick you out of the room. They're not going to be like, oh, great, let's whiteboard this with a bunch right. of people, you know, consultants who can facilitate design thinking. They want to talk to experts and they want to know right. what... They don't want to start from scratch, most of them either, is what I'm finding. I mean, right. there, there's some exceptions to that. And that brings us to the concept of accelerators, right? Because... Right. They don't talk, SAP doesn't talk that much about them in the keynotes, but it turns right. out the accelerators it's are really the key. a big piece of this. Maybe you can explain a little bit about well, that. Well, I mean, in terms of accelerator, that's sort of, um, 
it's a, a small bite-sized chunk of innovation. And I think that's what's critical because what, what you want to do is you want to say this particular process, this particular point in the process, this is where um, we could perhaps help you um, innovate, be more efficient. Okay. And what these accelerators are is that they are sort of um, 70% or they, they're supposed to be 70% standardized and 30% configuration. Right. So that basically you have a quick win. Um, and this is sort of the small chunk idea, which is the iterative process, which is sort of different than the usual ERP implementation that lasts years and years. This is a quick win where you can sort of innovate based on this this new technology. And the advantage there being that now you can combine the best of both worlds if you do that right, because what you can do is you can have a big picture conversation around what are your competitive challenges? You right. know, h- how are you trying to disrupt your industry or how would you like to? And then also then quickly move into like, here's a way to get started quickly. Right. Um, now, granted, SAP hasn't built out all those accelerators yet. Right. So that's, that's in some ways, that's still to be announced. So some of them exist, but a lot of them are still in process. But do you remember when we did the demo tours and they, they had a Leonardo example that was based on... Uh, it was like an airport management. Right. Um, and, and they presented it like a, a dashboard cockpit of different things you right. might you might monitor within an airport. And and it was sort of clever in the sense that from a dashboard view, you could drill into everything from like security, which would have like your live heat map and stuff. Right. But then then you could also start thinking about vehicle maintenance and right, or retail and, or, or retail. So there were these different components. And and what they kind of admitted when you pressed them was that uh, you know, that's not a realistic, that companies aren't going to want to probably buy that whole thing. Right. Well, from, from day one, you won't have everything. That, that's sort of like a representation of the five-year plan. Yeah. It's when you did all these various accelerators, then you would have sort of this this meta um, image of what, what the airport really needs. But I think that's, I mean, you need both because you need sort of a strategic vision of where you want to take, where you want to go with the customer and then start somewhere so they can, like I said, get, a, a, a quick win and prove the value of the technology and the, the methodology. But the catch is that if you want to start somewhere, you can't probably in most cases just whiteboard it. You're probably going to need to be able to say, oh, like in this case, let's say, oh, I want to start with some vehicle maintenance stuff. Because I think the presenter said that one of the airplane uh, industry folks were there and that was something that drew their attention because right. they realized they didn't really have that organized into into that kind of a view. And so, you know, okay, I want to start there now you need your transportation expert and now you need to show them this accelerator that you have and then you can start collaborating and and so the idea is kind of fits in with what <laughs> with what Bjorn was talking with us about which was just that this is a really key point that I don't think has gotten across with Leonardo is that on the one hand they want to get across to customers that yes we do this next generation stuff we're cool too we're cool too we're you know we're not just an ERP player we're cool right um, you don't have to go to other places for blockchain or machine right. learning. You come to us and have that. So they want to get that across. But what what they also want to try to get across that's still a work in progress is a different way of collaborating. So they talk right. a lot about partnering with customers. And and that's really what that workshop represents is, you know, right. they'll, they'll come on site and do their free session with you. Right. Um, I think they call it Explore mm-hmm. where they use Another. whatever. But the point yeah. being like they, they take that time and, and they want to then sort of per- be perceived as minimizing the risk for the customer right. in that stepping was- out into these areas. And so I think those are points they're, they they want to get across. But when you look at the marketing so far, you don't really right. see that so much. So Right. Well, I mean, it's also, what's also important to emphasize is it's just not SAP. It's all the partners should be enabled in this space yeah. as well. Because, I mean, they also have um, oil and gas or industry um, knowledge as well. And what's interesting is that when these sessions, when these design thinking sessions take place, usually there's um, a combination of people coming from either SAP or from a partner, usually an architect who understands the technology and a domain expert. And the idea is that um, both of these take a look at it and perhaps from this customer engagement, they can do an accelerator. Right. Um, so, I mean, so this is one thing which is also intriguing is that the accelerator is sort of, it's, it's a cloud thinking. Because it's the idea that you have a core which is um, standardized, and then you have a, t- a part which is um, configurable. 
but I mean, it's configuration. It's not you would go in and start coding. Right. So it's it's not you have this huge project where you just start going in and customizing. It's basically it's configuration. So it's the the cloud thinking, of course. And uh, in a meeting with Bill McDermott, one of our last meetings with him, I, I'm trying to remember which he, which one it was, but he he had said to us, um, you know, expect Leonardo to be bigger than the core SAP offering within 10 years. Like, you know, this is going to be big or whatever. And so I asked Bjorn about that. <laughs> He's the guy that gets to sort of, you know, chase a lot of the technology down around right. that. And his, his answer was interesting. And and I th- I think I think he was obviously more guarded than bill about right. making those types of promises which i totally understand that's not bjorn's role um but to, to me the challenge i see there is just it's a much it, it's such a different environment than when sap captured their erp market share right and well i mean the problems aren't probably aren't technical yeah um they're organizational they're change management yeah um because just think um, if you start to shift to accelerators of course then the whole way in terms of how you deal with a customer is is a, a lot different. Um, it's more cloud thinking. You go in, you have a, a much smaller, smaller chunk. Yeah, definitely. And and the other thing that that tied into that is the the different ERP modes, mode one right. and mode two. Do you want to talk about that for a sec? Because that was interesting. Well, I mean, it's always it's the idea that there are two modes. The one is sort of like the old fashioned. The other one is sort of like the the inner the the innovation, okay, and yeah. that's sort of mode one, mode mode two, and you always want to be sort of identified as the the mode two, the the innovative. Yeah. But um, you need both. Yeah. Um, and I think I mean I was thinking of blog title SAP. Don't be ashamed of your ERP um, history, or being an, e- an ERP provider because that's sort of where where its um its advantages because of that knowledge. There's your pr- blog preview, folks. Right. Yeah, and 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 I think that's. I, th- I think it's important to understand that there really are two competing views out there of how to how companies should progress from here because a lot of the the SaaS um, business application providers will tell a customer like, "Don't worry about your old ERP system right, right. now. Like, put a ring fence around that. <laughs> right. You know, maybe pull pull some data out of there somehow. Right. But but we're going to progress with this modern and and what their idea would be is sort of essentially you're going to gradually eat away at this legacy core by you're going to add more and more cloud functions and services right. and that core is just going to sit there and SAP needs and, and that also kind of ties into a Gartner thinking around this where they've talked about these different modes of right. IT and stuff and SAP needs to push back against that and I think right. they are they're trying to do that because SAP needs needs to make the case that you can't do digital without having this modern core that's real time yeah. uh, that that has all your process knowledge and that you need to connect that into right. your digital processes. And if SAP can convince customers that they need that, then suddenly they really have a seat at the table, right? Because now, Oh, you know, we do want to modernize that. And, and SAP is the perfect com- Once you, once you say, I want to modernize my core, that's a perfect message for SAP to come in and say, right. well, we can help you with that, you know? Right. So anyway. yeah, but I mean, I think if, if you take a look at um, S4, for example, they're bringing in machine learning. So, I mean, it's not like it's yeah. it's not, nothing's happening. They are bringing yeah. in the modern technology into the platform, especially in the cloud environment. Right. So they got to make that case right. that, that, that's, that that's what you need. Right. And, and I think it, in a lot of industries, I think you can make that case, especially when you start talking about, you know, industries where you need real-time access to information and, right. and it's not good enough to be, to treat your ERP assets like legacy. Right. But anyway, I think I see, like you're saying, SAP's got a lot of work to do in terms of presenting a view of this where they really are strong and not just, you know, pushing AI right. and pushing blockchain like everybody else. Right. So, all right. So, what else do we have here? We can have all this stuff with Google, which is interesting. Right. So, there's a lot of Google. There was Google partnership stuff, which was right. kind of a continuation from Vegas, I think. They, right. But there was more. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, I think what's what's fascinating is seeing how the partnership between Google and SAP sort of evolves. Um, initially, it was sort of, um, yeah, now they're one infrastructure player that you can deploy your Cloud Foundry stuff on. But as sort of time goes by, you see that they're sort of working together to create new things, such as the data custodian, right. which was a really important 
concept just because um, it enables people to really bring GRC into the cloud so that you can deal with saying things such as who is accessing a particular resource in a particular region, um, where's my data at, um, and as people move to the to the cloud, public cloud, that's often a concern. Right. And it's funny because I've had conversations with SAP in the past. Last year, I was really disappointed that SAP didn't talk about security at, security at all at right. TechEd, and I gave them some grief about it, and I was told by some powerful people that that we don't want to do that because we don't want to sort of put ourselves out there as as, as a t- sort of like hey right. you know invite to hack and i i just kind of feel like that's unacceptable i understand the concerns behind that but i just think you have to start having transparent conversations with customers about this and this year we really saw that and to your point right. around the google partnership as well um around the the data custodian and that's another great example of where SAP can have strength because they right. they have been dealing with industrial grade security for right. a long time, and and it being in Europe, the GDPR stuff is you right, know, which is the upcoming privacy regulations are on everybody's mind. But I think that's a great example of an area where SAP has a chance to really have an advantage. And I was I found it refreshing they were able to really talk about that. Right. I mean, I think what is interesting as well is that. The idea of multi-cloud is that a developer can develop anywhere, basically. Yeah. Um, but what you're starting to see is that that's really not the case because a developer usually has a mm-hmm. um, has a sort of cloud where they want to go. Okay. And for example, if they want to use the data custodian, then they would have to use GCP. Right. So I mean, you can use Cloud Foundry to go anywhere. But in reality, you'll probably want to pick a certain cloud where either you have a lot of other applications or it has technology that you want to use. Yeah, and we we had some interesting conversations about that because our 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 fellow blogger colleague Graham Robinson was asking about that too because he's he was saying that you know uh, a lot of companies are they really going to just go with one infrastructure provider without realizing the nuance right. the nuances of what each one provides, right? And that, that as they start to realize that, are they going to start to need some help with that? And then what role does SAP have? Because right now SAP right. doesn't really tell you this cloud partner brings this. to the, right. They don't help you with that process. So that's an interesting question of what role SAP should play in well, that. I mean, but, I mean, the question is, I mean, what, I mean, do, do customers really need that? Yeah. I mean, because this stuff has been around for yeah. a while. Um, and many customers already have assets in the, the public cloud. So they already have experience. Yeah. Um, so that's something which has And it's a really well. interesting, it's just a really interesting question in terms of, I, I generally support a lot um, SAP's move towards more openness around cloud choice in a variety right. of ways. Um, but it does raise a question in this area of choice, like it, does it, how much complexity does a customer have to deal with? Right. And and how much should SAP be helping them with that? It's it, there, I don't necessarily have an obvious answer there. I just think people are starting to ask that question because of right. these things. It's like it's not as simple as like oh let's have one infrastructure provider and then one backup infrastructure provider. It's like right. no, this one has security. This one's better at machine learning. This one's right. this one's got a data center and the location that we need. Right. You know, it starts to get kind of complicated. So, but I mean, I think it was interesting listening to the one. I think it was the CTO of Google Cloud talk about why they use open source or one 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 reason. And it said that people have the ability to move to a different cloud, like TensorFlow mm. or something like that. Right. Um, it's or Kubernetes. It's because that customers are more able to say, okay, let me go to provider A, knowing that the stuff that they're doing, Cloud Foundry, is is could be used in various other environments. Um, it's not going to be a hundred percent ability to move, but it makes it easier. So now that you're kind of doing cloud on a daily basis and you kind of have a, an inside view on sort of what works, how, how coherent do you think SAP is around these discussions around what they're doing with cloud? It's, it's definitely getting better. I mean, I think, I mean, the emphasis on open source and multi-cloud is a critical. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think what's also right now, it's still a little bit slow on the uptake are the business services. Right. I mean, we had the stuff from Yas, which was announced like about a year ago. And I mean, my expectation was always there's going to be many, 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 many business services, but they're not not there yet. I mean, usually if you take a look at the API Hub, many of the things are still technical. 
they're they're not business oriented. There's a mm. few there's things such as data quality and there's the S4 stuff, but all the other applications um, or or new business services or sort of microservice based, those haven't been either. They're they're there and they haven't gotten a lot of attention, um, but I haven't been able to find that that many of them. Then there's another piece of the puzzle, which was that that SAP made in, sorry, SAP, a bonehead decision to have a simultaneous event in Berlin that's more customer focused. And it, it ended up drawing different SAP folks to that event instead. Right. And once you make that decision, then suddenly you're missing people here. So the S4 HANA public cloud team wasn't here. Um, well, they they were there, but unfortunately, the we, leadership was not. Right. The leadership was not there. The people that I want to talk with about, like that, will say, "Here's how many customers we have, and here's where it's going, and here's our right. plans for the year." Those people were not here, and uh, it it remains an interesting open question because I think it is a, a really important part of SAP's future what they're doing there, and um, we just didn't get interactions with that. Now, granted, you know, most of the install base is not. A, you know, terribly concerned with the S4 HANA public cloud right. at the moment, but it it's leaves lingering questions. It's going to require some follow up on my part because I don't think I can wait until May to get that update. So I'm going right. to have to figure out a way to connect with those people and kind of find out what their progress has been. So those people weren't here. If they, if, if those people were here, what would you have asked them? Uptake. I mean, just figure out how many people are really using it. I mean, I think yeah. they're, it's the S4 is progressing. I mean, they have quarterly releases, I think. Um, but there's, I think there's a total of what thousand S4 customers, how many of those are really in the cloud? How many of those are live in the cloud is still right. Not, no, not, not really clear. Yeah. And, and how many are live in, in the public cloud versus SAP's hosted version is because yes. there's a lot more hosted folks right. and we've had those discussions before about what the pros and cons of that are. Right. I mean, I think one point that we have to remember as well is that there's a gap. Um, there's, there's always a gap between what most customers are having to go through and what happens at events like like this. I mean, SAP should show that, that the vision is there, but I think most customers are still, they oh, have yeah. other, other concerns. And I mean, I think what's, when you look at like um, HANA 2.0, I mean, the things that are coming out there, the, this new technology there. And one thing which was announced during the keynote was the ability to anonymize data in, in HANA. And mm -hmm. that was, I think, a really interesting topic. Um, primary, uh, one, one reason is because of the, the uh, customers who are dealing with the um, GDPR in, in Europe. But just, I mean, how do you deal with pushing data out in, in, a, in a fashion which anonymizes the, the data so that there is no ability to say this address is associated with an in individual or something like that? And that functionality is supposedly built into HANA. Um, which I think provides a great deal of value when you have to deal with laws and regulations. We had a, a session on Data Hub, which yeah. SAP announced uh, at the last tech head and sort of simultaneously at yeah. a couple of events. And we learned more. I feel like I have right. a better handle on why SAP. SAP is definitely putting some resources into this. Right. That, that much is clear. I'm still getting a handle on exactly what it does and why it's, why customers are going to want it. Um, any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I think what's interesting is that they're starting to sort of pull in all these different data sources. Mm -hmm. um, they're starting to pull in the stuff from Hadoop um, and HANA and other data sources and bring them all together in a, in a fashion so that they can sort of compress the data, analyze it better. Um, and I think that's what's what's interesting. And I think also, I think if I remember correctly, there's the ability to download sort of a trial version of the Data Hub I don't know whether that's that's out there, but I remember someone saying something like that. So that would be interesting for people to take a look at it to see really what it can do. But I mean, the the more data sources you have, and the more data sources you have, the ability to sort of massage the information. I think that becomes much more interesting because you have structured data, you have unstructured data. One thing we did talk about in the data hub conversation that was helpful to me to start to get a handle on it was just how that that basically you know your your internal data warehouse and, and or your, your, your ERP system, even if it runs on HANA or whatever, like it's, it's going to set, set up for certain kinds of data, but not right. necessarily processing all the data that you're grappling Sensor with. Sensor data, for example. Right. And then, and then also companies that have, in a sense, either been burned by Hadoop or, right. or they've realized the limitations, like, right. like that it's, it's an affordable 
way to store a whole lot of crap, right. but then getting it out, getting out the actionable part of that and using right. it. And so that's sort of where Data Hub fits into the conversation. And I do think it is going to really matter because when I talk with folks about like <laughs> what it's going to take to create quote unquote digital business models, you almost always are dealing with external data sources that factor right. in factor into product decisions or you know inventory distributions or whatever right. predictive scenarios or the machine learning that you want that you want it to be able to consume all this information right you know I've, one of the bloggers was like hey can you throw a twitter fire hose in here and right you know so so that part of it i think sap wants to have answers for for that part of that and so that's how data hub fits into the picture right and i mean i think what's also what's interesting to consider is that if you look at leonardo the pieces there's if you have an accelerator usually it just won't be one piece it won't be iot it'll be iot and big data and analysis something like that so it's the 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 leonardo pieces really you have to see them as a as a unified whole mm. which which is important to say so that you have you have iot data feeding into the data hub which is then going through or preparing the data for a machine learning algorithm to go through and try and look at predictive means or something like that. So there's the pieces that sort of fit together and it's not always, it's not always a good idea to see the isolated bits of technology. They all sort of work together. Yeah. Well, I saw some eye watering slides that explain how all the pieces fit. So you can probably check the tech edge stream if you want to get a closer look at some of those. I'm just looking at my notes. I mean, I think one, w we had some interesting blockchain conversations as well. Right. Um, and we talked with, uh, I just looking up his last name, because I'm not sure if I can pronounce it properly, but it's uh, Thorsten Zuba. Uh, sorry, Thorsten, if I got your last name kind of wrong there, but he's he's the head of SAP blockchain. And we talked to him about blockchain as a service and how he's supporting right. different initiatives, including the Leonardo stuff. And right. um, what I find fairly refreshing about SAP's approach is that they're not trying to claim that blockchain is going to change everything, but they have been right. pretty actively involved in Hyperledger, which if folks haven't checked it out, that's definitely one of the emerging areas where enterprise folks are trying to develop enterprise standards and right. functions around blockchain. Um, and it's just, gonna, I think it's going to be an interesting year for blockchain because we're going to see, I think, start to see s some more live projects in the new year. Um, and that's sort of what everyone's been waiting for is more production examples. Um, but, uh, Thorsten was telling us that they're still largely working on pilots and proof of concepts with right. folks, but but it 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 is interesting because in theory that block you don't lead with blockchain, but when customers start talking about pain points around authenticating assets or right. or maybe identity or other pieces or some type of smart contract function that blockchain is really good at then maybe that becomes part of the conversation. Right. Still early days. Yeah, I mean, I think what's also intriguing is that, although we haven't really mentioned it, I mean, all this stuff runs on the SAP Cloud Platform. Right. Um, so that's really becoming a real core component um, that as more things go through it, you start to see that SAP has an a level of operational excellence to deal with all this traffic, to deal with multi-cloud environments. And that, I think, is something which should be, I mean, um, which is often underestimated how important that is. Because right. without that, then you don't have, in terms of SAP, you don't have an efficient operational um, basis. And also for the customers, I mean, you have... Um, you have SLA violations, stuff like that. And SAP is actually pretty good in terms of making sure that the SCP environment is up and running. Yeah, I mean, just about every time we hear about some new interesting thing that SAP is working on, if you ask them if this is served up as a service in the right. SAP cloud platform, they'll tell you that it is. Right. Um, and in many cases, it was developed there first now. Right. Um, and so in theory, that really does present you with a unified place to create these right. kinds of services for for customers and it will be interesting to see as more partners get a handle on that what they can do with it um, right you know because some of the partners are getting more familiar with it but we i heard amongst our group partners in our group asking yeah. like, hey can we get access to this or that and that would potentially be i think real breakthroughs for some of these partners and what they can offer if they can get a handle yeah, on how but to use i mean it. but if, you, if you're a partner i mean what becomes even more interesting is not creating applications but creating your own services yeah and i think that's something which is still 
not totally clear how that's going to work. Yeah. Because as a partner, I combine three existing services and I create maybe two new ones and I take data from someplace else. And then I have a new APA, which I present to people. And how do I finance that? How is that charged to customers? How we is that s- built to customers? We Things had some like interesting that. IP conversations with SAP about that as well. Yeah, I mean, so that's IP and they have and they had thought about that. They they had they actually had some pretty coherent answers, in my opinion, for that. Right, but but it is something that has to get sorted. So right, because I mean, if I'm a partner, I mean, that's the way. Because you see that everything is an API. If everything is an API, then everything doesn't come from SAP. They come from partners as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't think we're that we're we're quite there yet for uh, partners to be able to do that. So there's one more thing I. I definitely wanted to talk about from my end, which was the, and this goes back to the issue, the issue that SAP doesn't like to talk about it. And they definitely didn't enjoy getting my questions on it this week, but it had to do with the lingering thing around indirect access. And the fact that I think there's still a sour taste in a lot of customers mouths about how some of that stuff went down and, and questions around how, how, how can I proceed with next generation projects? Um, you know, when I'm not sure what SAP is going to be charging me right. for or auditing me for. Um, though I think SAP struggled a little bit to answer those questions this this week when I asked them. I think the one thing I will say is I think that they have been pretty upfront that they're not done with that issue yet. And the, the good news for SAP is that from a next-gen tech standpoint, a lot of vendors are still working out how this right. stuff can be priced. But that's the logical conclusion to all of this in my view in the sense that if you have an iterative project that's sort of a start small with some new digital thing it also makes sense you would be looking at pay per use and pay consumption based pricing scenarios and they are working on that a little bit on the hybris side around some of the microservices and it makes a whole lot of sense for SAP to be putting more attention to how they can price that stuff because what I was saying is you can really flip the narrative from being on the defensive about how you handle this right. and sort of being the butt of a lot of industry jokes and such to taking leadership around that because right. you know you know a lot about this you know about data security and compliance you know which a lot of people don't you know a lot about um, you know how to stitch these things together from a data transparency standpoint. So now can you price that in such a way that is also really appealing for customers to get started? And that's an interesting and challenging conversation for SAP because it's not it's not just like a new mo- new pricing model. It's about can we make money this way? Can how did how yeah. do the sales staff respond to yeah, that? Yeah, how do the sales I mean, team, I, mean yeah. I think that's I mean usually let's say even if you have a subscription price which is goes over a year. I mean consumption model is totally different. It is. I mean how as a salesperson how do you deal with that? Yeah. Um, you probably have a lot of small sales rather than, than large sales. For and example. what I said to SAP is, look, a lot of the big cloud vendors are, are not innovating on this topic. Right. You're signing multi-year subscription contracts right. with them. But in, in my opinion, this that's the tricky thing about the cloud conversation is it might start as a technology conversation around where are we going to put stuff? And, and then you start thinking about better user experiences and things like that. But eventually you start thinking about start small, pay as you go, build incrementally. Right. That's where cloud is ultimately going, in my opinion. And, right. and customers are going to want to consume and pay that way in a lot of cases. And so SAP has a chance to to flip the script and get out in front of this issue. And I, th- I think we had some interesting conversations where I heard folks from SAP who are sympathetic to that viewpoint who are working right. on some of these things. So I'm going to be watching that with interest because... Right. If you can come out with a with some compelling offerings around how you're going to price some of this new stuff, then a lot of those concerns I think that customers have start to fade a little bit because right. it shows that you're really thinking through in a new way how how to do this and sort of throwing out mo- old models that don't work. But I'm not going to diminish how hard it's going to be yeah, for it's SAP definitely to do not, that. It's non-trivial because you could think of an accelerator that uses big data, IoT, machine learning. I mean, if yeah. you do consumption based. Um, pricing. Yeah, I mean, think of the complexity. Yeah, um, yeah. It's not. It's not going to be easy. But when you think about, I, I couldn't help but think about when I was looking at the um, the uh, security. What is it? The data console. Is that what it's the um, the Google? 
Yeah, the, 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 this, the Google security project that yeah. where the, it's the, all the data custodian, the data custodian, like auditing everything. Right. Like, couldn't you do the same thing in a sense from a pricing perspective? That's what machine learning is good for is compiling all those little pieces right. and saying, you know, here's here's what you should pay for this because this is exactly right. what you consumed. But look, I mean, this is not going to be easy for SAP, but I guess the point that I was trying to make with SAP folks um, during our bar conversations last night, which is always where it gets interesting, is that if you go to customers and tell them, we have this great new technology that's going to liberate you from your pain, that's that's not going to complete the process for you because right. cloud invokes an internal change that you have to go through as well. Right. And and the SA, a lot of folks inside of SAP understand this, but a lot of them don't. And they don't understand that what they're doing invokes change on the inside as well. Right. They, they're going to have to change how they do business in order to serve customers in the way they claim they want to serve them. Yeah, but I, and mean, I think that's the question. I mean, our customers, because I mean, it's a journey which SAP has to go through, but customers as well. Customers too, and and that's something that that we don't talk about enough is that customers are going through this as well, and a lot of them, frankly, are not very far along, and 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 sometimes I feel like they need to, from a customer perspective, I talk to a lot of customers where I'm like, you got to get out in front of this stuff, and then other times I have the totally opposite reaction and feel like, wait, your practical concerns are totally valid, and like right. like you talked about the standing room only session for right was data backup and recovery. Right. Right. <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, and, and if there'd been a Kubernetes session at the same time, what, there would have been like 10% of those <laughs> right. people. Right. And, and so to some extent, that speaks to like what their pain points actually are and right. stuff. Um, so, so yeah, it's sort of like this model where everyone has to, to change for, for this to work, right? Like, right. so customers have to change, SAP has to change, their partners have to change. And I just, I, I point the focus on SAP because I think tech companies tend to get a little bit arrogant about how we're liberating other people rather than putting the focus on themselves. And I think right. SAP is going to need both. But what is super interesting about this new tech is that it's far enough along now that it really always puts the focus back on broken processes and, and, and people yeah. and skills, yeah. because that's where companies st are struggling with this stuff. Right. Not that the tech is all the way there, right? I mean, certainly with right. AI and stuff, we're still in the early stages. But but for most of the kind of stuff we're talking about, a lot of the technology is there if you want to pursue a right. particular thing, right? Like if you want to put sensors on your vehicle fleet and start, you know, showing customers right. your delivery time, whatever. The tech is not your obstacle right. anymore for the most part. So right. anyway, that's that's a barroom conversation redux there for you guys. Anything else that you learned? No, I think I'm, I'm thinking cool. Yeah, interesting. So... So with the Kubernetes blog that you wrote right before the conference, yeah, that kind of got validated to a large extent on the the keynote and stuff. Did, were there, yeah. did you learn anything else from that blog um, for readers to be thinking about? I mean, I think what's interesting is that that story is, I think, just getting started. Because if you take a look at, there was a press release which happened, I think, which came out, I think, four hours after my blog came out, saying that SAP is going to support it even more. And if you take a look at the sort of Bjorn Gerke's quote in that, it's obvious that the SAP Cloud Platform is going to su start supporting other other types of, of, of workloads. Mm. For example, a container that an ISV provides you. Mm. You could then use that in the the Cloud Platform, stuff like that. So it's it's definitely, it's changing. Well, and I think that was one thing that, that really came out of your blog post too, because like we had this conversation yesterday after our meeting with Bjorn around like, that things are changing so fast that the like for example Kubernetes adoption has been so strong right. that it's now appropriate to think about like will this eclipse some of the things that with Cloud Foundry in some ways yeah. like so now you're starting to think about how those two things are actually going to fit right. together are they complementary yeah are they sort of more advers are they adv and Bjorn's on the board of both so that's going to help SAP a little bit yeah. in terms of uh, he's on the board of like both related standards right. initiatives so um, but but to your point because you raised the serverless computing thing in your in your blog as well like right. that's that's coming on strong <coughs> right so and, that's, that's the next thing i mean right. and there's there's always the next thing so sap just has to to build a platform that is fluid enough to 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 sort of allow for those shifts rather than try to sort of overcommit i think to one set of right. standards which is an interesting challenge for right. sap definitely Oh, and 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 listeners might want to know that. Um, yes, I did ask about the Android SDK. 
uh, that that one didn't go over so well. Uh, I, I think that the best way to talk about the Android SDK, because basically with SAP getting closer to Google, it's just a logical right. question to wonder because SAP's like right. really invested in the iPhone SDK. Right. And and when I step back from that, to me that's that's somewhat of a concession that that there's just huge advantages to Nate native right. apps. I mean, that debate isn't totally resolved because I think for certain kind of quick and easy stuff, there's the, the, yeah. the UI5 and the that kind of the HTML5 can still work well or some hybrid concept. But native apps have definitely prevailed in a lot of ways. And right. so it raises the question of how does Android fit into the picture? And um, I think the, the thing I, I guess I would say from SAP standpoint is that they're definitely looking at that. I, I can't confirm that they're talking with Google about that right now, but I, I do think that they're they're certainly aware right. of that, right, and the importance of that. So, yeah. and 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 just to just to be fair to SAP on that front, like going with an Android SDK is a lot more complicated than the right. than the right. than the Apple SDK because you're dealing with the all these flavors of Android. We were talking about like, okay, there's a Chinese version of Android that needs to be supported. That's right. like an older, like it's kind of mind numbing after a while, the complexities of it. Right. But I think it's fair to say that SAP is aware of the issue and, right. and, but I, I, I don't think we're going to see anything anytime soon on that. Right. So okay. folks who are pining for that, I would say you're just going to have to pine for a while and maybe, <laughs> maybe brush up on your Apple Swift skills. Right. Cause that's where you're going to be working for a while. Right. I agree. But, uh, and there's a lot of developer resources to check out. So if you if you folks are um, you know on the developer side, there's a lot of new stuff. Right. Hearing a lot of good things about Hana Express. Right. Like, like definitely. Even Graham Robinson likes Hana Express. He doesn't yeah. like anything. <laughs> SAP real. He, yeah. Well, not that, but he he's more like critical of what developers are provided with historically, and he's even right. happy with that. So there's a lot to check out. All right, Dick. Okay. We got to get you on a plane. Okay. Later. Talk to you next time. Bye.